And welcome to our November edition of Sports Highlights. Hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving toward the end of the month. Greg Picavaris, glad you're with us for our program since February of 1992, airing on TV on Mondays at 7 a.m., 2 p.m., 7 p.m., weekends at 9 a.m. on Cox Cable 47, 517. And for more, log on to nnpstv.com, at Greg Vick on Twitter. Well, we're talking about Newport News, folks. We have a Newport News person here through and through. Michael Norton went to Mitchville High School. He is a former head wrestling coach at Warwick High School, the boys soccer coach at Warwick. Yes, Mike, good to see you. Nice to meet you, Greg. Nice How did you again. get uh, involved in sports at Benchville? Uh, well, I came through the Pee Wee system playing football, and uh, you know, eighth grade, my gym teacher was uh, Richard Brooks, the running back coach and uh, longtime coach at Benchville. He saw the potential in me. He used to let me lift weights all the time during PE class to get a little bigger because I was only 100 pounds in eighth grade, and so I stepped onto the JV field at about 124, 125 pounds. Played fullback, running back, linebacker, all that good stuff. And I just stuck with it and hit the weights. Uh, I dabbled a little bit into wrestling when I was in high school. Also did pole vault, track, uh, shot put and discus and track and things like that. So I was around with you know, a lot of good coaches and uh, did all, all four years working, you know, doing sports at, war, uh, at Minchville. Right, but you played different sports too yes. at Minchville, like you yeah. said. Uh, talk about some of the coaches that made an influence on you. Uh, well, Richard Brooks, because he was the running back coach, like I said, so he, he took an interest in me. Uh, Jim Snow, he was the defensive coordinator at the time, tough coach, great guy, though. Uh, Charlie Nedicombe was the head coach. Um, I had some good coaches. Uh, Jim Bullock, the uh, line coach, he was a good coach. And even Gary Stevens, the JV coach, and Outlaw, those guys, Jerry, uh, I think it's Outlaw and Jerry Solomon. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a while since I thought about these guys. But all these guys were good influence. They really saw the potential in me. I wasn't the biggest guy out there. But they knew that I would, I would bring it, you know, and, and lay the wood, you know, as they say, to hit people and, uh, you know, play the game the way it's supposed to be played. At least it was played back then. November's kind of our homecoming show with Thanksgiving and everything. Of course, uh, Mike went to Mitchville. I went to Ferguson, of course, and we're trying to keep it here local, as we always do. You talk about the late Coach Snow, folks. A lot of you remember he used to coach Warks football team. He was the head coach from 63 to 70. Also, he was the athletic director at Mitchville, too. But he really made his name there as a baseball coach, oh, too. Oh, yes. I think he had over 500 victories as mm -hmm. a baseball coach and stuff. There was still a, a plaque at Warwick with his name on it. I saw it one day. It's like, I know him. Well, so, talk about your college uh, career. College career, well, when I was in high school, when I left there, I went to Shipyard Apprentice School, and I was down there for two seasons with the football program. Ended up getting injured, uh, my shoulder, and the yard just wasn't for me. It's a great place, but it wasn't what I wanted to do with my life. Growing up, I was always, I could draw in pain and stuff, and my parents always told me, you have art to fall back on. So that's where I went to college, ended up at Christopher Newport College at the time to work on my bachelor of arts degree in, um, in art and became an art teacher. Before we talk about art and your coaching stops, you grew up with Billy Wright. It yes. wasn't that easiest time, you, as you told me as a kid, you, it wasn't always easy for you and your family. But did that make you and Billy both uh, appreciate all the grind of what your family had to go through to get food on the table and also to play football? Because he was an excellent, disciplined passing quarterback at Menchville. Man, he threw the ball well. He was a great baseball player, too. Yeah. Uh, we grew up in, you know, sort of a little rough neighborhood, uh, but it just made us tougher, yeah. you know, to go on to play sports like we did and everything. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for the world. I enjoyed everything I've done so far in my life, and uh, so I wouldn't go back and change anything. Exactly, folks. You don't always have peaches and cream. Life is always uh, up and down for everybody, no matter where you come from or where you live. And Mike's a good example of persevering. I yeah. would say that because you've coached at a lot of different schools. Let's start off every place you've been an assistant and then every place you've been a head coach. Okay. I first started my uh, coaching career at Ferguson High School in the early 90s to mid-90s uh, with JV. Um, Aaron Brooks, a great quarterback, went to UVA. He was the senior that year, so I got the chance to work with him a little bit. This is all under Tommy Riemann. Um, I happened to be doing long-term sub at Ferguson as an art teacher and saw Tommy and started talking to him, and he brought me in the next year, and it just started everything from there. 
Um, while I was at Ferguson uh, with JV, I ended up being the offensive coordinator. Uh, Michael Vick came through his freshman year, had him for six games, we were undefeated. Then we had to bump him up to the varsity, which I knew they were going to take him before long. Uh, while I was at Ferguson with Tommy, I ended up coaching linebackers, running backs on the varsity level. And then eventually, I got a chance to uh, be the defensive coordinator the last two seasons I coached. Um, well, that's actually at Warwick. Man, I've been everywhere. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's where I started with assistant coaching there. Um, then in 1996, when uh, Woodside and uh, Heritage. Heritage came on board and mm -hmm. Ferguson was closing, I had the opportunity to become a teacher at Warwick High School in 96. And that was thanks to Jim White, uh, a former art teacher who's passed away, a great guy. He opted to go to Heritage High School, the brand new school, to be the art teacher there. That opened the door at Warwick because they only had one spot open. And Stan Mayer, the principal at Ferguson, ended up at Warwick. And Tommy was going to Warwick, so that ended up opening the door. It was great. Football got me in the door. So right. I've always been grateful for that. But you're a full-time art full teacher? Full-time, going on 23 years at Warwick High School. Talk about the illustration we have here today. Um, I brought in just one of my works that I do. Uh, being an art teacher, you do everything from drawing uh, to painting, watercolor, all different things. This is a piece that I did uh, in 2014. We actually had a snow day, so we're out playing in the snow. I had my kids, and we're just running around playing and ended up getting snow on my beard. So I decided to take my phone out, and like kids do, and, and took a selfie of myself and decided to do it for an art show out in Hampton. Uh, it's a show that those who teach, they put on at Charles H. Taylor. Uh, for, it's open for all teachers at all levels. And I entered that back in 2014 in that show. And it hangs in my house. It's just, I love it because it's a nice big drawing. I bring stuff like this in. I'm always showing my students. I've, I've always been one of those teachers that I'll show them what I can do to, not to impress them, but just to know that I know what I'm talking about when I'm teaching them techniques and so forth in the art. We'll talk about being an art teacher. To me, Michael, it takes a lot of patience. Oh, it does. And creativity, you know, because you, you, you get kids from all different levels. Uh, some kids that, you know, they just need that uh, elective to graduate. So they're not really interested in art. You try to find that niche that each kid likes. Uh, you talk to them. You get, you know, personal with them just to see where they are on things. And I'm very flexible as a teacher. I'll bend an assignment, change it up to fit that student just so they can be successful. Talk about uh, you're the boys soccer coach at, uh, at Warwick. Warwick. Talk about uh, your team for the upcoming spring. What do you expect? Uh, last year was a little, little bit disappointing, but we were a young team. I graduated five seniors, um, so we're looking to do pretty good. Uh, we're going to be a pretty solid team. We were solid defensively. Offensively, we didn't score as much, but this year I'll, I'm working on that. Um, so I think we're going to be okay. We'll be a little bit more on the junior side heavy. Um, but we've had some good programs and uh, good soccer going on at Warwick for several years now. When I took over the program, I tried to, to change the culture because I know Warwick at times had a couple issues where referees would, oh, we're coaching, you know, we're uh, ref in a war game, watch out these guys, they're, they're, they play rough. Mm -hmm. Well, we play the game like it's supposed to be played now. We play soccer and uh, it, it shows. A lot of times we get calls our way now. My, my guys say yes or no to the refs, only the captains talk to them. So I've changed the mentality of soccer at Warwick. Uh, they've had some great teams before I started coaching, don't get me wrong. But I've known when I first took over how the officials sort of treated us a little bit, but I've seen it change over the years. And, you know, I've had officials come up and say, that was a great game. Your guys were wonderful, you know, things like that. Uh, one time we stopped at the McDonald's uh, after a game all the way over in um, up in Williamsburg. And they were about to close. We came in. I had the manager thank me how orderly my guys were. That's nice. You know, it was very impressive. But you can also draw from your experiences when you were at Menchville, they had a good soccer team. Yes, you they know, had a so. good soccer team. Well, the curious thing is I never played soccer. Right. Yeah, so it, it blows people's minds sometimes. But coaching's coaching. I've studied the game. I started coaching when my son came through the ranks when he was younger and uh, helped out and became a, a head coach on the, you know, Little League soccer level and all that on rec soccer. And then it just evolved into high school from there. Michael Norton's paid his dues primarily in football, wrestling, and soccer. A credit to Warwick High School, academics, athletics, and activities. Mike, all the best to you and your family for the rest of the fall. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. My pleasure. Michael Norton right there. Went to Metchville High School, Newport News kid through and through. Now the former head wrestling coach at Warwick High School, still an assistant there, and giving back to his community in art and sports both. Stay tuned. We'll be back after these messages.
teachers important? Teachers are important because they help guide you into the right path. Because they pay the way to your future. They help you with education, they help you with math, they help you with science. Teachers are important because they're good helpers. Teachers are important because they can be good listeners. Teachers are important because they teach us good value. They help you with homework. They help you with reading books. They help you with your numbers. They help you with ABCs. And welcome back to our second segment of our November edition of Sports Highlights. Glad you're with us. For more, log on to nnpstv.com. Greg Picaveras along with our next guest, Jim McGrath, the Daily Press Sports Correspondent. Good to see you. Thanks for having me on, Greg. You've had quite a background. You've been a coach and you've been a correspondent. Talk about your sports background. Um, I mean, my sports background goes back to eight or nine. And I mean, it's transcended through Olympics. I got into running. I got into coaching. I got into sports writing basically out of coaching about nine years ago, and currently I'm doing both. <laughs> How do you do both? You also have a full-time job too, right? Uh, yes, I do. So I, I, time management's the key. It really is. Um, I just have to plan ahead, look things ahead week to week, and, ju and just go with it. You know, not think about uh, being tired or where I have to be next. I just stay in the moment. What do you do or notice different from being up in Northern Virginia? You had some roots up there mm -hmm. compared to this area as far as high school sports because the travel is a big deal now. A lot of the Newport News schools or Hampton schools are playing teams on the other side of the water. They always have, but travel, as you know, during rush hour is very difficult. Uh, very difficult. Once upon a time, I was a real, uh, real estate agent, and I mean, just to get from Springfield to Burke sometimes, five-mile drive could take 45 minutes. Uh, I don't, it, it, the, the problem was different. It's not so much the distance, it, it's the traffic. You know, I hear people talking about the traffic here and I, and, and I laugh. I say, yeah, it's getting worse here, but it is nothing like Northern Virginia. It, it's, it's really a night and day thing. No, in order to go to D.C. on a weekend, you have to leave at 5 in the morning, and I'm not being exaggerating at all. So talk about what stood out for you covering sports so far for the Daily Press. Um, what stood out, I, I Fortunately, the Daily Press has had me cover a lot of events, a lot of sports, a lot, and, and had the opportunity to meet a lot of people. So, I mean, it's tough. High school football, community sports has been my, I guess, bread and butter. Your notebook. And the, yeah, the community sports notebook, right, which comes out on Wednesdays. Uh, but otherwise, I mean, I've, I've been able to cover the Virginia Duels for the past six or seven years, um, basketball tournaments. Uh, just all kinds of things. I mean, I, it, the list gets too long, but, but if you name a sport, I could, I could probably reference something that I've done with it. You know, archery, cobia fishing. You know. <laughs> You've seen more and more uh, digital going online, whether it's print, broadcast, whatever. Uh, is that the direction you think the newspapers are going? You look at the New York Post, everything is based online now, breaking online. Right. You're not seeing the big stories on the print edition like you used to. No, because everything's about everything's in the moment. Uh, I mean, people want to know now. I know from covering football games, uh, once I started putting updates on my Twitter feed, people start, I, I, I notice that every game, even if I don't announce it, people will catch on by the second or third quarter and, and start sending notes and, and wanting to know what the you know, score updates. I'll even, at times, get uh, tweets before the game. Are you, who's covering what? You know, they, they want to know because they, they're going to just go online and find out, sometimes because they're from out of town, but sometimes because they're just not going to go to the game. Yeah, my dad used to say, if you know today's news or tomorrow's news now, you'll be a millionaire. But here's the catch-22. Y'all are still trying to sell newspapers. So yeah. I know in the past they told them, don't give out so much information on a Friday night. Let them buy the newspaper. But now we live in a world now where Facebook, Twitter, I mean, Sonny is constantly tweeting throughout the night. He is, and, 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 and the truth is, if you don't do it, somebody else is going to. Right. You could have four, four different outlets 22. covering any game at any time. Right. So you have to be careful of the print side and respect that crowd, but it's pretty much they want to know now. Exactly. Yeah. So how do you balance it? Uh, well, not being the sports editor, that's a very good question. I, how do I balance it? I, I just put in as much as I can. Whether HR Varsity wants to pick it up and retweet it seems to dictate 
whether it's notable or not. I think the biggest thing with the with the lack of print now is a good example. A long time ago, the Daily Press had the Times Herald, the Virginia Pilot had the Ledger Star, a morning and an afternoon paper. Those are a long, long time ago. I used to deliver the Times Herald, mm -hmm. but now you're seeing the Daily Press and the Virginia Pilot, not just in sports, but in news, owned by the same company, consolidating. Their writers in Virginia Beach are having stories on the peninsula and vice versa. Um, it's an interesting concept, and I would have loved to have been on a fly on the wall when they had those discussions. I, I think there are probably advantages. I mean, it, when, when teams from the South Side and Peninsula play each other, it can be covered on both sides by one person. Um, teams like ODU can be covered by one person, theoretically. I don't, I don't know if that's the case. I know Dave covers ODU sports here. Um, that, that's the good part of it. The bad part of it is now we're covering two areas basically with one sports staff and the south side community is used to the pilot people you know and then the peninsula are used to the daily press people but you know i'm in tv and radio both broadcasting goes to both sides of the water mm -hmm. online goes everywhere right people can see you on tv uh, if they if somebody on the south side see, seeing david teal they might be like we don't you know they might not I, know I've who seen he is tweets yeah. saying, wow they really have some good writers up on the yeah. peninsula yeah. And the pilot had Bob Molinaro and Tom yeah. Robinson for years, so it's kind of consolidating. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it's an opportunity for, for writers to reach a whole other audience, at least as large as the one they're working for now. Um, and, and hopefully that hopefully it's a good direction that will continue being in a good direction. And you're a good example of not just uh, in sports, but you also are involved with Deep Creek's Deep. track team. Talk about that. You're a coach. Cross country, uh, this would actually be my 18th year of coaching. I started right out of college in 1987. Um, I, I've been in and out of it depending on what my job situation is like. And I was at Denby and I was at Menchville. Um, I got out of it five years ago because, because of my job. Uh, it turned out I, I switched jobs. I'm working in Portsmouth now. And I realized two things. Deep Creek's only 10 minutes away from where I work. And... Chesapeake schools don't get out till 3.45, much later than here. Yeah. Uh, so I, I just started looking into it again. Not really serious, but this came up. And, and running is great exercise for the adults and the kids both out there as well. But when it gets dark earlier, that's, a, that's tough for the high school kids in track, isn't it? It hasn't affected us yet, and, and hopefully it won't throughout cross country. At least indoor track, they, they're more accustomed to running indoors. Mm -hmm. and, and Deep Creek has this whole indoor area. You can run 400s, the, the commons, if you will. Is it more difficult indoors or outdoors for running? I'd say indoors. Really? Um, because you're always, there's always the, the threat of snow, it seems. Um, you're always adjusting. There are a lot of teams practicing in the winter. And you, know, you have basketball, you have boys, girls, JV, varsity. When there are games, that, that knocks out one or two gyms. Um, there, there, just, there just seem to be so many factors with indoor. Some reason with outdoor, if the sun's coming out, things are changing. It's a little brighter out. The sun stays out longer. We seem to have more opportunities. And, of course, Newport News has the big one-city marathon, and your papers cover that a lot over the years. Oh, absolutely. I, I think they've done a great job with it, and I've been fortunate enough to do five or six stories. Yeah. Uh, relating to the marathon. A good example now, you going back to sports, is your editor is not even on this side of the water. Exactly. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> Have you ever met him? Uh, I've seen him at football games. Yeah. <laughs> it's we, a we've different met. World. Yeah. <laughs> it's a different world, folks. It's all going online. And thank you for elaborating about the online and also coaching, too. And, Jim, all the best to you and the Daily Press and also Deep Creek. Well, thank you, Greg. My pleasure. Jim McGrath right there, Daily Press sports correspondent, Hampton Road Sports Media Hall of Fame media consultant as well. Stay tuned for our next guest as Sports Highlights continues in November. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a scientist. I want to be a doctor. I want to be an engineer. Our younger students have the right idea. Today's leading careers are involved in science, technology, engineering, and math. Newport News Public Schools has embarked on an aggressive STEM education initiative that prepares students to take full advantage of STEM opportunities in higher education and career fields. So, what do you want to be when you grow up?
And welcome to our third segment of Sports Highlights, our November edition. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone, and hope you enjoyed our first two guests today, Michael Norton and Jim McGrath. It's a treat now to talk to the brand new head varsity boys basketball coach at Heritage High School, Lou Radford, who also played at Heritage. Lou, good to see you. Thanks for having me. Heritage had some great coaches over the years, like Dennis Katubas and Mike Gardner, and we'll start off with that. It's not easy uh, replacing Mike Gardner. Absolutely not. Uh, I'm fortunate, though, to have him as a mentor of mine, and coming behind him and Coach K, who I play for, uh, they really set a pattern down for what success is and put me in a place really to kind of carry you on the torch. So right. that's the good thing about it. And you're going to have to do your own style. Are you going to bring some of your own players that you played with kind of to talk to these guys, how it was done back then? Or have you got a game plan set? Yeah, I think one thing that was important for me is to devote some time to finding the a, a staff that's young and has the culture instilled in them uh, that Heritage Basketball is really known for. So, yeah, we put together a, a really nice staff, uh, mainly of people who have some connection to Heritage. And a lot of my guys have played at Heritage and, and, and were really successful. I'm sure it's a dream come true. And that's important to have a good staff. You're all buying in the system. Absolutely. Um, as we talk as a staff, one thing we keep in mind is that each one of us, you know, we have parity. Each one of us is good at something and is able to totally operate in their role. Uh, there's no real diversion to what I want to do. Um, I'm going to be okay because I know who they are with them fully operating the way they want to operate. And I think that cohesion is important for us to be successful. Right. We're talking to uh, Lou Radford, the head boys basketball coach at Heritage High School. Greg, think of Eris, glad you're with us for our November edition of Sports Highlights. And uh, we're here in November now, so the season's right around the corner. Absolutely. Uh, I think now is a time where we're really starting to preach to our kids that we have to be unifi unified. Uh, this is a team that's lost a lot of seniors, um, and they're learning how to play at a high level. So as we go into season play, we're definitely going to have to rely on each other rather than one specific person uh, to accomplish the goal. And, of course, they play eight-minute quarters. That hasn't changed since you were in school or when I was in school. I like that. It's a comfortable amount, but it's also a time commitment, too, as well, because there's no shot clock still. Right. I never wondered why they haven't evolved to a shot clock. Yeah, I think, I think you know, the high school level, part of preparing kids to go on to the next level is going ahead and implementing that shot clock. Yeah. Um, especially when you get those teams that are really good at holding the ball. Mm -hmm. That's just not a part of the game that's going to last after the high school level. You've got to know how to run your stuff, get to your spots, and execute, especially when you want to hold on to the lead in the game. So I think I wish they would put 35, 37 seconds, something like that in the, the high NBA's school. The NBA always been 24, but they've changed the college. And, of course, the girls play 10-minute quarters in college as well. And I like the 20-minute halves, and I like the 12-minute quarters. But eight-minute quarters are nice, but the shot clock would be added value. I think it will be very special for the game. Like I said, you know, part of what makes the game of basketball entertaining is seeing the change of possessions constantly. So hopefully uh, VHSL will kind of be, you know, a pioneer for that and change that pretty quickly. How do you preach the fundamentals, Mike, when you see high school, college, and NBA games? Even when you were at Wagner, it seemed like a lot of times a lot of these kids just run up and down the court with no strategy. Does that drive you crazy as a coach that you tell them to guard this part of the basket and practice and play a certain opponent, but they kind of do helter-skelter? Does that get on your nerves? It, re it really does. And I think one thing with our kids, because they don't grow up knowing the game. So we preach to them that, first of all, the rules are different. You know, in the NBA, for example, you can't be in the paint on defense for three seconds. Mm -hmm. So you guys think the paint is wide open because they made some great move, but the rules don't allow them to. You know, one, one of my teammates, actually, who worked out with LeBron James, taught me that when he caught the ball, he would count 1-1000, 2-1000 until the help defense has to leave, and then he would attack. So helping them understand what's going on away from the ball. Uh, and then the other big thing for me, when I really get frustrated with them, I tell them, uh, you want to make all these moves and the court isn't even the same size. Right. So there's so much more room to do your own thing in NBA basketball, and that just does not translate to high school basketball. A lot of these high school gyms are old. Denby, Menchville, and Warwick, there's not much space there. Not at all. You so. know, you guys got a nice court, you and Woodside do, but not every course is cozy. I mean, Bethel and Hampton, Kinkatan, Phoebus, these are old school courts. Yeah, and that's a major adjustment for the players, especially when uh, they're not cognitive of that. And you realize something that might have been working at a bigger school like Woodside, especially in transition play, uh, you get somewhere at one of those smaller schools, and you're like, 
hmm, seems a little bit more stuffy. So it, it causes us to make adjustments as coaches too. We're talking to Lou Radford. He's the brand new head boys basketball coach at Heritage. Talk about your career. You went from Heritage to Wagner and talk about some of the places you coached at. Right. Uh, I think, you know, even going back to Heritage, uh, I felt I didn't realize how special it was uh, because I played with a special group of guys and I actually was able to play varsity at the ninth grade level. Mm -hmm. Uh, so going on, that allowed me to really be a playmaker at Heritage High School, and I still kind of hold on, hold on to that legacy. I bragged out my kids that uh, I'm still the scoring leader. You know, we've had a couple of guys that should have beat me, uh, but because I played all four levels, uh, all four years of varsity basketball, I have that title still, and um, that allowed me to really understand what it's like to score the basketball and play at a high level. Uh, so when I got to Wagner, I was humbled a little bit, uh, playing with some guys that were really special. You know, I had one teammate, Jamal Smith, uh, who was on Carmelo's high school team. Mm. So uh, this guy, you know, he could really play play ball. Um, and they taught me a lot, and it really taught me to change my game a little bit. Um, so when I got back here, you know, I made, I made a responsible decision to come back to this area uh, to have an impact on this area, uh, on the 757, on Newport News, uh, specifically Heritage High School. You know, um, I think about when I was uh, at the school I was at before in Hampton, I said, I'm not leaving until I can go to Heritage. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I got the opportunity to come there and to coach, you know, it was really, it was a blessing. I felt like, you know, it was a godsend for me. Kind of like the loyalty George Massenberg has with the football team. Even though he went to Hampton, you can tell he's a Heritage guy. Absolutely. Did you grow up as a man in New York? I did grow up as a man. Um, you know, letting you know how personal it was for me. Here I am on a scholarship uh, in the middle of New York City, having the best time of my life, but at home, you know, I have, I have six brothers and sisters, there's mm. seven of us. So things weren't easy there. Um, my mom, I couldn't, she didn't give me a monthly allowance. Uh, when it was time for me to go back to school, I had to find my own way a lot of times. Um, so, and God's blessed my mom where she's transitioned and doing some better things, but I'm thankful that I came up when I did so that I could grow up to be a man. Uh, and that's really what opened my eyes and made me realize I got to get back to Newport News. And those are some steps too. You said you played varsity all four years, so you kind of grow up quick. And then you grow up in New York too, especially away from Newport News, which is a small city compared to the Big Apple. And you travel on the road to play all these different colleges. You have to get along with all types of people. Oh yeah, I mean, you got to be able to at least go up to somebody in the subway <laughs> who doesn't want to talk wow. to you. And you know, do I ride the A train or the one train? <laughs> Uh, so yeah, that, those experiences, I'm really thankful for them. Uh, they helped me to realize, hey, it's a big world out here. Uh, you gotta be ready for that. Right, uh, talk about uh, what are your goals for this first year? I think our major goal for this year is uh, to compete. You know, I'm not big on really trying to look into the future and say we're gonna claim something that, that isn't realistic or maybe realistic. I just don't wanna say that particularly. I want us to come out and play basketball the right way uh, be unified as a team and compete every day, every night. So because it's a team sport, if you see somebody ball hogging, I guess they'll come on the bench quick, right? Right. Well, I, I'm hoping that we won't get to that point, but right. uh, yeah, our, we're going to have principles there that you know. One thing we've taught our kids since summer is that hey, this is a team full of weapons. So you know, when I'm in war, I use my whole arsenal. Um, you know, I don't just rely on my shotgun or my AK-47. There are different battles that require me to pull out my tank or right. you know, my aircraft carrier. Right. Do you still make cuts for the team? Yes. Wow. There was nothing worse than being cut on a, on a team, but you have to persevere. That's what life's all about. Absolutely. And especially being a teacher, you know, you get those kids that come up to you and want to kind of be coddled and expect to have some kind of personal relationship, which is great, but that doesn't, that doesn't equate to being successful in the basketball court. And we'll leave with geometry. That's a given, right? Absolutely. There you go. All right. That is the head boys basketball coach at uh, Heritage High School. And for our fans out there, tell them your full name. My full name is pronounced Leishian Radford. And, of course, that was hard to pronounce, and people probably thought you went to Radford. Right, absolutely. In fact, when I was getting recruited by them, uh, that was part of their pitch, you know. Yeah. Hey, you know, you get to play with your name on the same school as, you know, you go to. So We'll just call him Lou. Everybody calls him Lou. Lou, all the best to you, my friend. Thank and you. I appreciate it. Brand you new me. boys basketball coach at your alma mater. Absolutely. Very good. All right, folks, we want to thank all of our great guests today, Michael Norton, Jim McGrath, and Lou Radford. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Thanks for watching our November show. For more, log on to NNPSTV.com. It'll be on the homepage, also on YouTube, and on television, as always. For our great crew, led by Ray Price, thanks to Fazoli's as well. I'm Greg Bicaveras. We'll talk to you soon.